Hey guys, it's Nathan. This is episode 65 of the Nathan Seawood Show. Uh, welcome to the show. I hope you're all having a fantastic week. I'm coming to you from uh, New York again and just here till tomorrow before I head off to Europe and the Greek islands, uh, which is super exciting. And I'm so uh, excited to have my guest this week, uh, who's been one of my great teachers, one of my great mentors, and who I'm just meeting for the first time, Dr. Gay Hendricks. And Dr. Hendricks uh, is a trained psychologist. He was a psychology professor and is now the author of over 40 books, including Five Wishes, Conscious Living, and the book that's had the biggest influence on my life, The Big Leap, this book right here. So let me welcome you to the show, Dr. Gay Hendricks. Thank you very much, Nathan. It's really great to be with you. Yeah, so uh, so privileged to have you on the show. As I say, this book has changed my life. And probably a lot of the concepts in this book uh, people have heard of, and maybe they don't necessarily attribute it to you, but things like uh, living in your zone of genius, which, you know, in my circles is a phrase that you hear all the time, uh, the upper limit problem, those kind of things that are attributed to, to you in The Big Leap. Uh, Tell us a little bit about this book. Why did you choose to write it and uh, how did it come about almost 10 years ago? Yes, well, it's very exciting to be talking about this again because the sequel to The Big Leap is about to come out in September. So we're uh, gearing up around here for the launch of that, which is going to coincide with my wife's birthday this year. So we're going to uh, publish the new book on September 25th. So be sure and let all your folks know. Uh, but Absolutely. going back to, um, I always say that uh, The Big Leap uh, it took me 30 years to figure out and then a year to write because I started thinking about the upper limit problem back in the 1970s. And I began to realize first in my own life, uh, all of my books and my wife and I have written 10 or 12 books on relationship in addition to the books that I've written. And so, but all of our books are grounded in things that we have found to be personally useful. So they're you know, they're not theoretical, they're grounded in science, but um, they're expressions of the heart. And so the, um, the way to approach the big leap is to realize that I made every mistake that it's possible to make just about in my own personal growth until I began to discover some of the ideas of the big leap just in my own life. Speaking of the upper limit problem, I noticed now on Twitter, there's a hashtag called upper limits, which I'm really glad because people fill in new things about it all the time. But how I first started noticing it is in my own life in two ways, in my body, in my, um, in my physical experience, I would notice that I would feel good for a few days. I would be eating really well for a few days and um, you know, exercising and I'd be feeling really good. And then all of a sudden I would sabotage myself. I'd go out and eat a bunch of food. I'd go through the cycle again. And I realized that I had some kind of upper limit on how good I was allowing myself to feel. And I would keep bumping up that against that upper limit. And then I'd keep lowering myself back down to where I was before. And I noticed the exact same thing in my relationships. This was uh, long before I met and married Katie, my wife now of almost 40 years. But uh, back in the early 70s, I would notice that I, I was in a relationship. I had a girlfriend at the time, and I noticed we would get along really well for a little while, and then we'd have an argument. And they would always seem to come out of nowhere. And I figured out that we were allergic to a flow of intimacy, that after a while, we couldn't tolerate the flow of good times anymore, and we had an urge to mess it up. And so I realized in these two areas, both in my physical well-being and in my relationships, that I had some kind of tendency to sabotage myself when things started going well. And so I began to ask myself, why do I do that to myself? And I began to talk to my clients about that. I was getting my PhD at Stanford at the time, and I was working in the counseling center there as part of my internship that all of us PhD students had to do as part of getting our doctor's degree there. And I began to check this out, even with successful executives that I would work with. Stanford is right in the heart of Silicon Valley, which was just beginning to 
be the place it is today back during the 70s when all those high tech firms were moving in like Intel and all of those. And so it was a hotbed of really smart executive software engineer type folks who were very out of touch with their feelings. And so a lot of my clients were people who were very successful in the engineering world and at work, except in the area of communication. And then when they go home after work, they would have the usual problems of communication that people have if they're not in touch with their hearts. And so, you know, in our education programs, you know, getting your PhD, you do a lot of work on improving your intellect and your cognitive ecology, but you don't do much about improving your heart ecology. You know, the, the way you come at the world, you come at the world from a place of compassion and forgiveness and open heartedness, or do you come at the world from a place of no trust, fear, sh hanging back in there. And I, I, I'm not meant, I'm not meaning to pick, pick on engineers and technology folks, but like my wife was doing a, a consultation at uh, what was then Bell Labs back in New Jersey. And she was working with a team of incredibly smart engineers. And they'd been working as a team for a year and a half. And in the course of working with my wife one morning, she was doing a process where they were going around and talking about their wife and kids and things like that, their home life. And two of the men found out that their kids were on the same soccer team, but the two men did not know that. I mean, that's amazing to me that, uh, you know, and <laughs> neither one of them had been at the soccer game at the same time. Their wives knew each other, but neither of the men had figured this out yet. So. There's a lot of work that we all need to do. As I say, it's not just a, a problem of technology and engineers and folks like that. It's a problem that all of us have. I say the longest journey of all is the 12 inch journey from the head to the heart, because to do that, you have to find out what what angers you in life and what makes you sad and what makes you scared. And so in that long journey to the heart, a lot of us get lost along the way because we don't know the tools and we don't know the layout. So I wrote the big leap to provide the map for what's underneath your upper limit problems, what you can do to actually fix those upper limit problems. And so that was really the, um, in Turkey, they have a, a saying that if a bald man finds a cure, he will first use it on himself. So everything in the big leap is, is used on myself first and then shared with clients. And I was a professor for 21 years at the University of Colorado before I retired to run my own institute. And so over those years, I, I trained about 1,200 therapists. And so I had a lot of opportunity to try out these ideas and these techniques on a lot of different real life folks out there in the real world. Yeah, I read, uh, when I was researching for this conversation, I read that you said with your wife, you've researched everything in the bedroom, the breakfast table, and the boardroom. I thought that was good. <laughs> That's right, because a lot of the consultations we've done have been in the boardroom with big corporations. And then, of course, we work with couples where we're working a lot with bedroom um, issues. And we've always said that the only sex organ you need to pay attention to is the voice box. Because when you learn how to communicate better with your feelings and learn how to communicate what you want and need and things like that, that clears up about 90% of sexual issues as well as boardroom issues. Yeah, I love that. And I, I like what you said about, you know, those uh, engineering types. I've, the, the quote I've heard is, they get hired for their IQ and fired for their EQ. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of the companies I used to work with in the high tech area, I used to do more on site consultation where I would go into the company. Now I've gotten to a place where they send them here to me. But uh, in the old days, I would go and they would often have some of the technology people kind of hidden away in the back where they didn't have to have a lot of human interactions <laughs> because they, a lot of them are, you know, Asperger's or borderline autistic type folks if they're a real genius. And not just in the high tech area, but I've met amazing pianists and amazing musicians and quite a few amazing actors who have that ability to connect when they're on camera or have a guitar in their hand. But when they step off stage, it becomes a different type of arena and they have fears that come up then that block their voice box. 
Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, you, you mentioned a few people in the book. This is not limited to uh, just people that are, say, struggling with their lives. You mentioned uh, some of the musicians you've worked with, some uh, prominent figures that you've worked with that are just as impacted by the upper limit problem as anybody else. Yes, and it's so beautiful when, when you work with people in the public eye because you can actually see the results, you know, as they take their upper limit problem off and then suddenly they win a Grammy or suddenly they're they're getting the part that they wanted to get and things like that. It's very satisfying, but it's just as satisfying to work with, you know, like sometimes we work pro bono work for people who, who can't afford it, who come in, you know, maybe a high school junior that is having lots of issues around some kind of problem that nobody can figure out. And so, you know, we have the pleasure sometimes of being able to meet with somebody like that and helping them move through something and see their, it's not like they're going to go out and win a Grammy, but it's going to be able to talk to a girl for the first time or take a test for the first time and score the A on it instead of getting all frozen up and flunking it. Which is just as big a deal in their world in that moment. Exactly. Yeah, the a uh, couple of things that I, you know that stood out to me uh, around the upper limit problem. There's a question that you asked that I, I think the first few times I glossed over, but I reread the book recently. And you say, uh, can you open yourself up to the possibility of experiencing more happiness than you've ever felt before? Mm -hmm. Which I think before you even see, hey, why am I holding myself back? Why do I sabotage myself? You have to open yourself up to the possibility of experiencing more happiness. Yes, it's just like if you want a breeze to come in on a warm day, you need to open up that window just a little bit, maybe, you know, just to admit that or open up the door a little bit. And um, I happen to say that because it's a very warm day today and I've been thriving on all the breezes we could get. Um, so um, you need to have a willing heart and a willing mind. And it and you don't need to believe anything different. It's just that you need to open yourself to seeing the world a little bit differently. Because if you've been looking at the world as a dangerous place where you can't get your needs met, you're looking at the world through a certain pair of lenses that's based on your own personal experience. And that personal experience has to be acknowledged. Everybody's got one of those. But you don't want to keep wearing that set of lenses your whole life because you're missing out on what's actually going on in the world around you. And uh, I learned that uh, there was this great experiment done when I was at um, in graduate school. They had a machine called the tachistoscope. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. it it's a thing that uh. flashes. It's a, uh, there used to be a thing called a view master that you looked at it and, and you could see a scene through it and then you would click and it would change the scene. Well, this is kind of like that, except it flashes a picture at you really fast in like a 20th of a second so you can't exactly see with your conscious mind what it is you have to kind of guess at it and that's what makes it an interesting experiment because they would take a bunch of people what they were actually flashing was a yellow pencil you know the kind i'm talking about with mm. the uh, eraser on the end so a yellow wooden pencil was what the actual image was but then here's the thing they took a group of people and they had them not eat for eight hours before the experience, uh, the experiment. And so they were all hungry. And then they came in and looked at the picture being flashed at them. And guess what they said it was? What? A banana. Right. Because their own internal experience was shaping how they saw the world. I mean, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Mm. It was a very simple experience. The other thing they did was they did another version of it where they were showing the same yellow pencil, but they brought people into the room where they were going to do the experiment and they had them drink several glasses of water until they had to go to the bathroom. And then they did the experience, uh, the experiment before they let them out to go to the bathroom. And this time they didn't see bananas at all. They saw the pencil as a long flowing river, um, <laughs> like the yellow river. And uh, many of them guessed water images, that it was uh, a, a river or the, a lake. It, it was something, but it wasn't food related. So it tells you again that how we are inside often shapes the way we actually see the world and see other human beings. And 
it's not until the windows of perception are opened up a little bit with our hearts and minds being open that we can begin to see the world actually as it is rather than filtered through our old uh, conditioned perceptions. So, so the real question to ask yourself is really, can I be open to the possibility that what I see isn't the whole picture? Or the way I put it, when I first begin to catch on to this, I'm suddenly beginning to realize that everything I know is wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know, because so, uh, like in my relationships, I would get off to a great start. And then after six months, something would happen and split up or, you know, something would, the person would move or I would move. But I never could get past that place where I would always seem like I sabotaged myself over and over. Once I began to figure out the upper limit problem, I realized that I could create my life a whole new way, not in that in that old way at all. And so that's the nice thing about human existence is we can always reprogram ourselves. We don't have to keep following the same old program. Just like if you stick a new a uh, disk in your computer or put some new software and it suddenly begins to work a new way. Well, in, you know, our minds are the same way. We, we, we keep running the old software. It's not going to make any changes in our life. Uh, there's quite a few people watching live now, so I just want to welcome everybody that's uh, joining Dr. Hendricks and I for this conversation. There's quite a few questions coming through, so keep those coming through and I'll make sure we get to those a little bit later. And uh, uh, Dr. Hendricks and I are going to pick the best comment or question at the end of the show and give you maybe a copy of your free book, Dr. Hendricks, when it comes out. Oh, yes. Um, I should uh, mention that uh, uh, my new book comes out on September 25th and uh, my, wife, my wife's birthday is that month and we're celebrating her birthday with the release of the book. And so I'm very excited about that. It's got a whole new set of tools in it. It's got one thing I call the meta tool. Um, and um, I'll touch on that a little bit today, but to give you the whole tool, I'll have to come back on the show after the book comes out and, uh, and talk to you again about it. Perfect. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the book, obviously the, the upper limit problem we've been talking about, uh, is the zone of genius, which I, again, I said before, I think a lot of people quote that now, the zone of genius, maybe not knowing that that's you know, one of your core concepts and that the new book is going to be diving more into that. Uh, can we dive in a little bit about what the zone of genius is? There's some fascinating things about it, uh, distinct from the the previous zone, the zone of excellence. So maybe the, the, the difference between the two and how we can start moving more into our zone of genius. Yes, that's really a great question because most of us get stuck. If uh, Kind of if we're lucky, we get stuck in our zone of excellence. But if we're unlucky, we, we stay in our zone, zone of excellence too long. Because if you're doing things that work in the world, if you've got a good job maybe, or you're doing good work, or you're making the kind of money you wanna make, um, you're often functioning in that zone of excellence. And the problem is that people keep wanting, to, wanting you to do more and more of your zone of excellence. That's a great point. You keep doing more and more of it to please everybody, but you're not pleased inside because you don't want to stay too long in your zone of excellence without opening up to that zone of genius, which is really where you're functioning with your full potential on the table, where you're out there with your full potential. Your zone of genius, by the way, in the new book, I've stopped referring to it as a zone because it's a little bit limiting to call it a zone. Uh, the new terminology I use is the genius spiral. Uh, because it's more open-ended. Mm. And I say that when you get on the genius spiral, you'll be there always because you'll keep going into more and more and more heights of your genius. Kind of like a, a hawk or a bird that's soaring up into the wind currents. It's very effortless once you get on the right path. So, But the zone of excellence is you're doing good work, you're getting good feedback, you're probably making good money doing it, but you're not satisfied inside. Here's the fact that I've learned after 40 some years of counseling, I think close to 20,000 people now, you're never gonna be happy until you get firmly established in your zone of genius. It, until you start getting into the genius spiral, 
you don't really feel satisfied inside. And so the best thing you can do for yourself, I always start people with 10 minutes. If you want to get started on your genius and you don't know any other way to do it, go in a room by yourself where you're not going to be interrupted for 10 minutes and just ask yourself the wonder question. What I call a wonder question is a question you really want to know the answer to, but you really don't know the answer to it. That's a good wonder question because that's going to pull new stuff out of you. So you go in a room for 10 minutes, you sit where you're not going to be disturbed, and you simply ask yourself, hmm, what is my genius? Hmm, what is, I have another phrase that I coined in the new book, which I'll give you a, a preview on. I call it true creativity. What is my true creativity? And I distinguish true creativity based on that your true creativity serves you as well as other people. When you're using only your limited creativity, you're using it often to please other people, but not to please yourself. You're in a job where you're using all your creativity to do a job maybe that you don't want to even do. And so um, I've had so many people come to me. Again, I'm not going to pick on lawyers here, but I bet I've had probably 40 to 50 lawyers, very successful lawyers come to me over the last 30 or 40 years and say to me some version of this. They're saying, I'm at the height of my profession. I'm making close to a million dollars a year. Everybody in my family likes the new SUVs and the ski trips and the boat and going on the ski vacations and everything like that. But I feel like I'm dying inside. That conversation is a classic zone of excellence conversation because what happens is you're using your genius to feed other people, but you're not feeding yourself. And the harder you work doing that, the more dissatisfied you get. So you got to start with a real personal encounter with yourself. And if you haven't yet gone in a room for 10 minutes by yourself and done this process, I'm talking about with wonder questions, as soon as you get off this uh, broadcast that we're on with Nathan and myself, I'd like you to do that. Go in a room for 10 minutes, set the actual alarm on your phone, give yourself a full 10 minutes and do nothing but this. Hmm, what is my wonder question? I mean, what is my zone of genius? What is my genius? And then take a few easy breaths. Don't worry about getting an answer, just hmm, what is my genius? Hmm. So I want you to cultivate a sense of wonder and I want you to breathe with it. And I want you to just make that a sacred space of inquiry. Again, getting the answer is not the important thing. Learning to live in the question is the important thing because it might not be during that 10 minutes when you get the answer. It might be during a dream tonight or it might be in something a person says to you next week that will spark off something. I'll give you an example. I created a business in 2003 um, with a, a business partner of mine, Stephen Simon, who's a movie producer. He's produced lots of movies. You've probably seen like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure <laughs> and uh, uh, What Dreams May Come. He produced that and Somewhere in Time is a famous, famous romantic movie. Uh, but he produced 30 some movies during his Hollywood career and then he got kind of burnt out on it. And he and I created a whole different type of movie business. We created something which is still in existence called the Spiritual Cinema Circle. And it uh, provides inspirational movies every week to many, many thousands of people around the world. And I, I sold that business now uh, some years ago uh, to a big company because it got too big for me to run. But let me tell you, where the origin of that came from. It became a multi-million dollar business, but it started out one morning with me in meditation. Hmm, I'm getting this idea. Hmm, I want to do movies a whole new way. How can we do this? There are plenty of movies out there, but nobody ever sees them unless they go to a lot of film festivals. What could I do? Hmm, all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, the idea came for me. Oh, 
we'll license the movies for a month, send them out on DVDs to people, and then they can enjoy them wherever they are, and they'll get a new collection every month. And so this was the genesis of the idea. And I called Stephen at like 5.30 in the morning. I get up early. I'm an early riser, and I usually spend the first uh, half an hour or so after I get up meditating. And so after I finished meditating, I talked to Stephen, and I said, I got this idea. You want to do it with me? And he said, heck, yeah, that's the best thing I've heard in ages. We'll hot wire around Hollywood. And that's what we ended up doing. We hot wired around Hollywood. And so we didn't have to go through the usual BS of mainstream Hollywood and try and see, because he and I had tried to get movies produced down there, inspirational movies like Conversations with God and Illusions by Richard Bach and things like that. And we just kept running into a stone wall. People kept mm -hmm. saying, nobody's interested in those kind of spiritual movies that you guys are interested in, you know. Uh, but you know, look, we had these, uh, you know, we created a multi-million dollar business doing it a different way. So everybody's got their own unique twist on their genius. You know, it comes in slightly different flavoring. So don't think that your genius is going to look like anybody else's or the business that you create is going to look like anybody else's. It's going to have your particular flavor to it. But it all starts with that communication with yourself. Hmm, what really is my genius? I love that. This is very real for me. I was an airline pilot in my former life. And really? I, yeah, I realized that very much fell in zone of excellence for me. But it was something I wanted to do since I was a little boy. So, you know, it was a, kind of the, the boyhood dream that I got to fulfill. But it was only after a time that I realized, okay, this is, this is great. I'm really good at this. I can do this with my eyes closed. But this is possibly not the thing that fills me up the most. I, I hope you weren't doing it with your eyes closed, literally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I refuse to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, that's an interesting thing because I asked an airline pilot once, I don't know anything about how to fly a plane, but I happened to be seated, seated next to an airline pilot that was on his way to, you know, how they fly them on different planes around to do different things. And so I asked him, what's the very best thing about being an airline pilot? And he thought about it for long periods of time. And then he said, it's that it concentrates my attention for brief periods of time. He said, when I'm landing an airplane, I can't be thinking about anything else. Or when I'm taking off, I can't be thinking about anything else. And so I obviously asked him, I said, well, what keeps you from bringing that quality of attention to your marriage? Because he'd just been complaining to me. I'd only known him for about 10 minutes, and he was already complaining about his wife. <laughs> I think people must, must smell that I'm a psychologist or anything, because I don't tell them, <laughs> but oftentimes they'll start telling me these things. I've had people sitting next to me in airlines telling me the most outrageous things just on the drop of a hat. They'll start telling me things. I think it's because I've sat in that the energy chair value. for 40 years. Yeah. But yeah. anyway. I, that was really interesting to me that I bet at the heart of being an airline pilot, there's a moment of absolute pure Zen Buddhist meditation yeah, with bringing that thing with 300 people in for a land. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely said that same thing myself because you, when you're flying an airplane, like especially in those moments just before landing, you, there's nothing else you can think about. All your presence is focused on that moment. You're not thinking about, oh, why did my dad not do that why didn't he love me when i was a kid or whatever <laughs> you know, you're just sitting there right in the moment and it's you know that's one of the most addictive things about flying i think is that it's one of those activities that takes you right into the moment um you, you said something interesting about the zone of excellence in the book as well and you've kind of touched on it but you said you people are very reliable in the zone of excellence you know we're reliable to the people around us and i noticed when i moved into my zone of genius which is i consider to be having deep conversations whether that's with people like you or whether that's with coaching clients uh it's it's being in deep conversation with people but it's a lot more ambiguous than airline pilot uh -huh. yes absolutely because you never know you don't have routines to follow and you don't have instruments to guide you as well as you do on an aircraft yeah, exactly. And just uh, in terms of, you know, I love what you said about the, the kind of meditating on those questions and not necessarily coming up with an answer, but learning to sit with the question, learning to be in that context. And that's very different to just doing something, doing something day in and day out that you know how to do. 
Yes, one of my favorite um, quotations comes from the poet Rainer Maria Rilke in his book, Letters to a Young Poet, um, where he says, be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart. Learn to love the questions mm -hmm. like unlocked doors that you're unlocking. You don't know exactly what's behind them, but if you just love the questions, then your life will become an answer to those questions. That's why I think that the better quality of questions you can ask about your life, the happier you will be. You know, because I used to ask myself very poor quality questions like, what's wrong with me? And once you ask yourself, what's wrong with me? You can think up a lot of things. You know, it's you only one way you can get up. But if you ask a better quality question like, hmm, how can I get the kind of love I really want in my life? Or how can I communicate with my beloved so that our problems clear up without having to go through these big arguments that we go through? You know, questions like that that are high quality questions produce high quality answers. But you can't be grabby toward the questions. You have to kind of breathe them into being. Hmm. How can I meet my beloved? Hmm. Like if you're a single person, instead of saying, what dating sites should I join this month that will give me the best opportunity? Or what's you know, wrong with me? <laughs> what's wrong with me? Or um, Ask yourself, hmm, what adjustment can I make in my mind that would effortlessly bring a beloved to me? Mm -hmm. So you ask questions like that, that have that kind of ease to them and that kind of open spaciousness to them. That produces really fast results. That's actually how I manifested my wife, Katie, in a month. I was 34 years old. I'd made every possible relationship mistake I think it's possible to make between the ages of 17 and 34. And when I was 34, heaven knows why it took me so long, but I finally got around to doing this thing that I'm talking about. I went in a room by myself. I actually sat down on the floor on a cushion and I just sat there and I said, hmm, what do I really want in a close relationship? And I kept asking myself that, hmm, hmm, hmm. When I came out of that, an hour later, I realized there were only three things that were really important to me. One, that I wanted to be in a relationship where both of us could be absolutely honest with each other. Because I'd been in lots of relationships where we didn't tell the truth to each other and it created all sorts of problems. Number two, I wanted to create a relationship where both of us would take responsibility for things that came up rather than always defaulting to blame the other person. Mm -hmm. Again, I'd be, been in one. dozens of relationships where we were always blaming whose fault is it? No, it's my, it's your fault, not my fault. No, it's not my fault. It's your fault. And we could go on like that for days. And so I wanted to figure out how to take responsibility in a healthy way. Hmm. How is this my issue? as well as yours. Hmm, what can I do to change this? Not what you have to do to change. You know, so I wanted to find a person that could do that with me. The third thing I wanted to find a person who was really committed to her own creative path, because I'm very committed to writing. I, I get up every morning and I usually write for a couple of hours. And so I go in a room by myself for a few hours and I come out with a few pages. And if, and if my partner doesn't understand that there's conflict there. And I'd had conflict in other relationships where the person was always saying, you know, why do you go off in a room by yourself every day? You could be sitting with me watching TV, you know? And I say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to go in the other room by myself and write. So I don't want any conflict about creativity. So I, my third request was, I want somebody that really is comfortable with their own creativity and is as passionate about it as I am about mine. Once I got clear on that, a month later, I met Katie. And we had the most amazing first conversation that sort of went like that, where I said to her, I'd love to ask you out for coffee, but I want to let you know that I've come to this big realization. I only want relationships where both people tell the truth, both people take responsibility, and both people are comfortable with their creativity or are committed to their creativity. So on those terms, would you like to go out and have a cup of coffee with me? And so she said, she went like this. 
Yeah. <laughs> Finally, after about 15 seconds. And so it was this beautiful start to our relationship where we begin in this state of real openness. Beautiful. I love that. And uh, yeah, that clarity, what that clarity can do for you. Uh, I'd love to just uh, go through some of these questions if you're open to it. We can answer sure. some of these people's questions. So uh, while we're on the um, zone of genius, uh, I'm just going to bring up Leanne's question. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. So Leanne uh, lost her uh, fiancé, who was also one of my good friends last year. And just to give you some context for this question, so she says, when you feel extremely lost after a tragic life, tragic life event, how would you find your zone of genius? Yes, well, first of all, when you're dealing with a tragic life event, like the loss of a partner or loss of a dear friend or mate, what you have to do first is make a space for your grief to be fully realized. And by that, I mean, you need to let yourself feel that first to feel the sadness or other feelings may come up too, like fear or anger or other feelings that are related to that event. I used to work a lot. I was in a project where we worked a lot with uh, recently bereaved uh, widows and uh, who were depressed for long periods of time after the loss of a long-term relationship. And I found that the only way people were always telling them to snap out of it and here, you know, let's do something fun or, but you can't really ride over the top of the feelings. You have to acknowledge those first. You have to acknowledge your deep sadness. And then out from that begins to be able to breathe with it again and open up to new possibilities. But we always say here that when a relationship breaks up or the death of a beloved or the death of a dear friend, give yourself at least a month for every year that you've known that person in order to fully grieve the loss of that relationship. Mm, so if it's, yeah, as a rule of thumb. So, you know, uh, I had a person in here recently who had a 29 year um, marriage and uh, his wife passed away uh, due to cancer in her sixties. And he's on now into his seventies, but hasn't really been able to get through it yet. And what we found was missing was this element that I'm talking about, about making this 12 inch journey from the head down to the heart. No matter how many times you say, oh, my dead beloved is in a better place or whatever you say in yourself to your mind, you can't use your mind to override your heart. You must have the two working in harmony. So you need to use your mind to embrace all the feelings that you have going down, not just in your heart, but in your belly too, because a lot of our feelings are down in the area of fear, which lives more down in our bellies. Generally speaking, human beings have three uh, feeling zones. One, the anger zone, which is up in the back of the neck and the shoulders and the jaws, you know, where you eh, kind of clench up here. Mm -hmm. The sadness zone is more in the throat and neck and um, chest area where you feel kind of a heaviness of your heart or a lump in your throat. And then the fear zone is down below around in your navel area where you feel those butterflies in your stomach and maybe in your solar plexus where you feel a kind of a grabby sensation when you're scared, butterflies. So we need to pay attention to all of our feeling zones because unless we're open to those, we're not functioning as full human beings. If you look at the human brain and what it's, it's the size of a grapefruit. So the human brain is about the size of a grapefruit. You know how thick the rind of a grapefruit is. It's only about this thick, maybe a quarter of an inch thick. Well, that's how thick the thinking part of the brain is. The feeling part of the brain is down there it's the size of the juicy part of the grapefruit. You know, it's a very good comparison because the rind is, is useful and protective, but it's a little bit dry. The mm. inside is not easy to protect. It's mushy and juicy, but that's where all the good stuff is. When the two are working in harmony, that's when life is magical. Beautiful. Thanks for that. Hopefully that uh, helps you 
uh, Leanne. Uh, I love this question from Alex saying that uh, you were talking about lawyers and that they felt empty inside or, you know, in their zone of excellence. How much of a kind of a warming up process did you have to do for them to start being able to listen to their heart or their purpose? Well, people have a have a learning curve in that area. And depending on how long you've been kind of close to your feelings, it can take a while. I remember a, a, a Vietnam vet that we were working with that after nine months or so, he finally made a connection. I remember him saying, he looked down at his hands and he says, oh, my palms are sweaty right now. That must mean I'm scared. And it was true, you know, because he was having a very intense conversation with his wife at the time. And he said, oh, my palms are sweaty. I thought that was so brilliant because that's, again, making that connection between heart and mind. And the floodgates opened up there. Suddenly he was in touch with all his old sadness, his anger, his fear, his joy. It had all been kind of hidden under there. And so some people, you know, might take nine months to open up to that. And there's a small percentage of people also that never will fully be able to do that. Just maybe their conditioning has been too strong or maybe they just don't want that in their lives. Um, maybe they just prefer to stay at that more intellectual mental level and don't really want to go into their full wholeness. And we have to honor that and acknowledge that too and say that you know some people that's not a priority for them. But I would say that on the average, it only takes people a few sessions to be able to make these kind of connections I'm talking about. And now we have also lots of e-courses. So you don't have to do these things like we have, you know, our program for single people attracting genuine love. And we have a program for couples called Breakthrough to Bliss, where we have all sorts of ways to do it on your own, sitting in your pajamas in your living room. You don't have to actually show up in a class somewhere. That's the beauty of technology and the Internet. Beautiful. Great answer. Uh, it's another question from Jason, who happens to be my brother in New Zealand. And it's a big question, so it's, it's blocking out the, uh, the screen, so I won't leave it up there. But uh, he was talking about how when he first learned about the upper limit problem, he could see it very clearly and he could notice some of the things that we've been talking about. And even with that awareness and, and feeling more evolved, he still gets hit with the upper limit problem in a small daily way. And so the question is really around how do you progress through even when you have awareness around it? Yes, I was just noting your last name, Seward. One of our big streets here is Seward Street. So some of your ancestors must have uh, made That's it all cool. the way over here. Where are you, by the way? Well, I live in Ojai, California. And right. uh, Seward Street is a big street in Ventura, which is down the hill from us on the ocean. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so I live 11 miles from the ocean up a little mountain valley called the Ojai Valley. Beautiful. beautiful. It's in Southern California. Although in the summertime, it gets a little intense heat wise. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. Well, one of the reasons in the new book, I call it the, geni the genius spiral is because in a spiral, as you go up a spiral, you pass the same place over and over, but from a new perspective. So you may come around and notice the same issue, but you are got a little bit more distance and space from it. And you see it happen no, less often. You know, like it's common in the beginning when we work with couples, that couples are arguing every three days, for example. And then after they've worked with us or taken one of our seminars, they start arguing every two or three weeks. And then eventually they stretch it out further. So it's they're only having an argument every two or three months. My wife and I started stretching it out back in the early days of our relationship so that we eventually, about 20 years ago, decided to actually put ourselves on a complete diet of no criticism or blame with each other. And so we've, like I've lived in this house I'm in now for 17 years, and neither one of us have ever spoken a critical word to the other in this house. And so we can say we haven't had an argument this century. So eventually <laughs> you can learn to stretch it out into centuries. Uh, but appreciate yourself for where you are. Please, um, please, and convey this not only to your brother, but also to 
anyone else that's viewing is that we all have to start where we are and just opening up more and more to your genius spiral every day is a step in the right direction because as long as you stay with that commitment, it's going to keep happening every day. Um, a little bit more of your genius is going to be revealed. If it all plops in your laps the first day, you probably wouldn't know what to do with it all. It needs to be kind of uh, revealed in small doses. Beautiful. A, a quote from uh, Dr. Dyer was, uh, infinite patience has immediate results. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne was a great friend of mine. Wow, that's cool. So we only got a few minutes, uh, a few minutes left. So uh, Rachel Grant just said, "Could we do maybe a rapid fire finish this type uh, thing?" So I'm just going to fire a couple of questions off to you and just give your your uh, your first response that comes to you. So my zone of genius is for me personally. Yeah. Oh my my zone of genius is what I call my genius spiral. All has to do with learning every day how to tap into more and more of my creativity, my ability to love myself, my ability to create abundance in my life, while I also inspire other people to do the same. So it sounds I, like a mantra that I once heard. Exactly. Well, uh, I call it the ultimate success or universal success mantra, the idea that to go around the world opening up more to your own creativity while providing that service for others is a really delicious way to live. Uh, what the world needs right now is? More people who are absolutely committed to expressing their genius. Spirituality to me is? A warm-hearted feeling of openness and love that extends into me and everyone else at the same time. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, my definition of love is? Being able to be in a warm-hearted space with a person where we both have our best interests at heart. Beautiful. There's a sort of a common theme, isn't there, between all of them? Yes, I think love and space have a great relationship with each other. Because if you think about it, the more we love ourselves, the more space we give ourselves for our creativity to shine through. Same thing with another person. If I love another person, I'm creating an open space for their full creativity to develop. That's to me, love at its best. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Hendricks, at times almost up. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm just going to put uh, your website up on the screen, which is just hendricks.com. Uh, oh, it just disappeared there. But uh, we know you've got the new book coming out. Is there anything else uh, that you wanted to let people know about that they could learn more about you or any courses that you would like people to know about? Well, we have a full range of live trainings here uh, that occur here in Southern California. In fact, we have... Um, Wednesday of this week, we have about 70 or 80 people going to descend on us for our big summer trainings. We do a big one in the summer and a big one in the winter here. Um, and then we do others around the country and in Asia and uh, Europe. So all of the schedules are on our website at Hendrix.com. Our e-courses are over at HeartsInHarmony.com, Hearts in Harmony. Uh, that's where you can go to take all of our distance learning courses. And um, the new book is called The Joy of Genius. It's available for pre-order now on Amazon. And uh, then in September, we'll be releasing it. That's perfect. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to read that. And I've got to get used now to saying the, the genius spiral instead of the zone of genius, which I've been <laughs> using the last few years. <laughs> uh, so... The last, uh, the last question before we finish, we ask everybody this question, and I'm interested to hear your answer. Uh, and it relates to what we call the dark side. So do you still relate to the concept of a dark side? Do you have a dark side? And is there something you have to watch out for? And is there a way that you've learned to embrace your own dark side? Well, I view it as whatever is referred to as a dark side is just stuff we haven't learned to love yet. Mm. And it's a process of, to me, human evolution is a process of learning how to be an unconditional love. And some people have a tiny drop of that. And some people have a huge amount of that when they get started, but hopefully people develop that as they go along through life. 
And the dark side to me is simply the sum total of everything I haven't learned to love yet. And I probably have some out there left, but uh, to me, I'm in the process of learning to love myself more every day. So um, I'm not going to try to concern myself with what's light and what's dark, just whatever comes my way. I do my best to love as much as I can from wherever I happen to be. Yeah, I love that lesson. Your dark side's whatever you haven't learned to love yet. That's a beautiful way to finish. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Hendricks. As I said, uh, I can't gush over you enough. You've been a huge mentor to me. It's a privilege to be able to just speak openly like this to you. So thank you so much for all that you've done to me, my clients, and all the thousands of people that you've impacted. It's, uh, yeah, it's a real privilege to speak to you today. My pleasure, Nathan. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, there you go, folks, uh, my conversation with the lovely, wonderful Dr. Hendricks. If you know anybody that would benefit from this episode, please share it around, uh, send it to them, and uh, I will love you forever. So thank you, folks. Uh, until next time, I'll be back uh, next week with episode 65 of The Nathan Seward Show. <laughs>